Hello teachers, today we're going to talk about the march in D major from the Anna Magdalena notebook. Sounds like this. This was written by Johann Sebastian Bach's son, Carl Philipp Emanuel Bach, and Johann Sebastian put it in his notebook for his wife, Anna Magdalena. There's quite a collection in that uh, book of not only pieces for keyboard, but also a few songs and chorales. And as I'm sure many of you know, there are some very famous pieces for students to learn how to play early Baroque style or early leveled Baroque style, things such as minuets and polonaises and all of those. There's another march also by CPE Bach. It's the one in G major. too. That one is just slightly harder than the D major that we're going to look at today, but a lot of what I'll talk about today would also apply to that one. So you might be wondering about the BWV Anhang 122, that very long catalog number. BWV just stands for Bach Werke Versignis, which is just the Bach catalog of works to number things. Anhang uh, can either re refer to pieces that were lost or that we don't think Bach actually wrote. And so this one, we know that his son wrote it, and so that's where that Anhang number comes from because he included it in his notebook for his wife, Anna Magdalena. Uh, this piece comes up in many collections. It's a well-played piece for um, early intermediate students. It's in the Bastion Piano Literature, a book one. It's in several other collections. It is on the RCM uh, level four and is in the current Celebration series book for that. For my Illinois colleagues, this is on the AIM level six, along with many of these other pieces from the Anna Magdalena notebook. Today, I am actually looking at this out of my Henley Urtext of the notebook for Anna Magdalena. And whereas I don't require my students to buy this, most of my students would be playing early Bach pieces out of an intermediate repertoire series, such as some of the ones I mentioned, I think it's really important for me as a teacher to know what was actually written in the urtext or what Bach actually wrote, um, as opposed to what has been edited by a contemporary editor. Uh, and so, I don't know if you can see this well from the camera, but this piece has nothing written besides pitch and rhythm. The fingerings in this edition are editorial, so Bach didn't write those. Uh, there's no slurs, staccatos, dynamics, nothing of that sort. So it's just important to remember that since Bach or the composer did not write those, it's okay for us to have some creative choice and some thought on it. And there's no reason why if we're looking at an edited version that we can't change one of the ideas about the articulation or the dynamic choices that the editor has put in. For me, I love to encourage my students to be creative with this time period, and I like showing them the Urtext page to just say, look, you get more choice here because the composer didn't actually write any of these things in the score. So let's talk about now what skills or knowledge your student needs to have to effectively play this piece. It's in D major, so hopefully your student is familiar with D major scales and the primary chords in D. There definitely are some scale patterns in here, as well as broken D major and A major chords. Um, so it's really helpful if they just have an idea of what those are and feel comfortable with that. Um, we have one trill in measure seven, and many of the edited versions will give you an idea of how to realize this. Um, the way I prefer to play it is, what I tell my students, just two wiggles. So starting on the C sharp and two wiggles. And if you have questions about Baroque ornamentation, basic ornamentation for this level of student, I'd love to chat with you about those. I'm hoping to make a video in the future about that as well. Um, we are in cut time for this piece because it is a march. And I think in many ways, a march is more accessible for our 21st century students than perhaps a minuet or a polonaise or another antiquated dance form. Since we live uh, decades after rock and roll was invented, we're very familiar with common time, four on the floor, or even cut time, uh, marching bands. You know, any students of yours who've played in any band are gonna be very familiar with cut time. And when I teach 
something like this to a less experienced student, I always allow them to count it originally in their initial learning in four. Four, one, two, three, four, and one, two, three, four, one. However, it's really important that they do understand that the time signature says cut time and that they learn to transition that into and one, and two, experience before of a student playing a march or similar piece in cut time and they feel it so strongly in four that their tempo is far too slow and I'll often make them get up and just march a little bit in my studio with me and feel one two one two or whatever is appropriate for that piece and then suddenly it clicks oh this is supposed to be fast and I need to move along and feel it in two so that's just something that you want to make sure you cover in this piece, especially if your student hasn't had a lot of experience in cut time. And it can take a few pieces for students to really understand that if they have had a lot of experience in common time, and this seems a little bit foreign. Uh, the last thing that is really important in um, Bach intermediate pieces, and then of course in advanced pieces as well, is the articulation. And, um, this is where people will disagree and talk a lot about performance practice and what might have been done on a harpsichord versus what is done on a modern piano. And the reason that it's totally appropriate to disagree about this is because once again, the composer did not give us slurs or other articulation marks. I do have an entire lecture given at a conference that's available about Baroque articulation for intermediate students, and I will link that to this video. Um, but just to say, especially with a bright, happy uh, march like this, I want my students to play with a good, crisp, detached articulation for most of the quarter notes. My left hand, I want to sound like this. towards a really legato style and it actually makes it much harder to play. So if this is one of the first um, Baroque pieces that my students are playing or one of the first from the notebook for Anna Magdalena, I'm going to use this piece to train them to play their quarter notes and half notes detached. And then of course because the eighth notes are moving so fast I'm happy for them to play them legato or semi-legato. So the sound I'm going for would be this. Uh, and it's one that will take some significant practice. Because of the polyphonic style, you should allow your students to do plenty of hand separate practice so they hear the individual lines and know what their left hand is doing just as much as they know what their right hand is doing, and then work on that coordination of detaching. I've had students who've really had a hard time doing this in the past. One thing I've done that has worked for me is to just change all those quarter notes, say in the first two measures or so, to an eighth note with an eighth rest, to have them really feel, this is not a short staccato, we're not playing, you know, we're not doing that, but to feel that there's a separation between each of the notes and that we're not connecting, but lifting. Of course, if your student is able to have a nice relaxed wrist and freedom to move around, that will make it much easier for them to do this than if they're in a locked position and kind of crawling along the keys. I hope that gives you a few tips for how to teach the march in D major. Please consider subscribing to my YouTube channel and visit my website, and I wish you all the best in your teaching.